Sorry. Uh, sorry for the delay. So, any questions before we start today's class? Okay, so yesterday we saw a general introduction to the course with a rough idea of what it is that you can expect to see covered as part of this course. Okay. Today I want to jump straight in and sort of we will be looking at the equations that determine the current versus voltage characteristics of a MOS transistor. Before that, very briefly I want to get into what does a MOS transistor look like, right? Literally, what is the structure? How do you make a MOS transistor, right? But at a very, very high level. So, I hope most of you would be doing either the VLSI technology or semiconductor device modeling courses. Those courses will tell you a lot more detail about what we are going to cover in today's class. I am literally covering almost the entire course in one lecture as we stand right now. Okay? Which means that I am just going to pretty much give you the equations, give you a high level overview of what is going on. Sufficient to understand how a transistor works for the purpose of digital design. Okay? We will not be going into details of why a transistor behaves the way it does how you can modify it, what are the other changes that can be made and so on and so forth. All those are the subjects of another course. Okay. Alright, so first things first, what does a MOS, NMOS, enhancement mode, transistor look like? The typical view that, the most common view that is used is so the side view that we have over here, which we will also be using for explaining some of the characteristics. There are two N plus regions, a P-type substrate, an insulating oxide and a conducting layer on top of that which acts as the gate. Now these two terminals, the N plus terminals are completely symmetric. I am arbitrarily calling one of them the source, the other one the drain. Right? But if you look at their, how they are created, they are perfectly symmetric, there is no real difference between them. Now this is what it looks like from the side. This is an insulating oxide. This is a metal. I am putting it within quotes because in practice this is not really a metal that is used over there. Any kind of conducting material is sufficient, usually polysilicon is used. Okay. And of course the substrate itself is also a terminal. Right? Strictly speaking you also need to make sure that the substrate itself is connected to some voltage. You cannot just leave it floating. Okay. This is normally called the bulk terminal. So effectively the MOS device is a four terminal device. You need to know what the voltages are at each of the four terminals in order to know how the device is going to behave. Okay. Now this is not the scale obviously. The bulk is usually very thick compared to all the other regions that we are talking about over here. Okay. Plus the thickness, is, the thickness of the gate oxide is in the order of few nanometers whereas the length and width of the transistors are hundreds of nanometers. Okay? So don't worry about the scale of this picture. What is important is what are the relative positions and the nature of the different devices. So this is a side view. What does it look like from above? What we have is an N plus region, another N plus region and in between we have this region which is the polysilicon gate. Okay. So one thing you would notice over here is when you are creating such a device you need to sort of make sure that those two N pluses 
imagine that i am trying to create this right i don't get to make it from the side i have to make it from above because after all i have a vapor a sheet of silicon on which i am trying to create this transistor okay so what happens there are two n plus regions that i need to deposit in order to create the source and the drain and i also need to create that gate oxide and the polysilicon layer on top of it in order to create the gate and all of these need to be aligned very carefully so that there is proper transistor like behavior between the device terminal okay in practice what is done is a number of so called processing steps in the semiconductor manufacturing are used i'm not going to go into what a processing step looks like that will be the subject of the real estate technology course okay the important part as far as we are concerned is there is one step where i say to put down one region over here okay right now i have just defined it as an active region i have not yet made it doped okay so this is just an open region on the silicon as far as i look at it right now this is still a p type substrate okay but i create a specific region over there which is left open okay the rest of the region is covered with some thick oxide layer so that nothing will happen over there across this i put another layer of material which is polysilicon okay and after i have done both of these i then go ahead and dope this entire region including the polysilicon with n plus okay before putting the polysilicon i also grow the gate oxide over there okay so effectively what i have ended up with over here is from the side if i look at it this is the polysilicon these two regions are n plus okay and the polysilicon itself has also been implanted with some n plus impurity what happens to the polysilicon when you implant it with impurity it becomes a better conductor okay so for all practical purposes it becomes like a purely conducting material okay now what has happened over here we have got the structure that we wanted right two n plus in between there is a gate oxide region an insulating gate oxide on top of that a conducting material polysilicon right because of the way that i created this i did not put down two n plus regions and try to draw a gate between them i just put down one entire region and drew the gate across that okay which means automatically the locations of the two n plus regions are determined by the positioning of that gate itself right there is never any question that the two for example i can never have a situation where n plus is here gate is here and the other n plus is over here right this should be misaligned okay whereas this is a so called self aligned process the reason the reason why we call it self aligned is because by the very nature of construction you make sure that the two n pluses are never going to be misaligned they are the positions of the source and the drain are determined completely by how the polysilicon layer is grown okay now one other thing which is important over here and which we will discuss a little bit more when we get to the tutorial on the magic layout tool is the so called design rule okay
now a design rule is in this context something very specific it just says what are you allowed to draw right you are drawing patterns on a silicon wafer right those patterns essentially correspond to the layers of polysilicon n plus p plus the contact metal wires all of those okay now there are some restrictions on what you are allowed to do with those and those restrictions are what the design rules chapter okay what kind of restrictions an example minimum width of a layer of any layer right what kind of layer polysilicon metal n plus c plus n whatever it is the minimum width thickness not thickness but you know the side width width that you can have is 180 nanometer okay this is an example right this would be true for example for a 180 nanometer process for a 130 nanometer process the design rule would be different for a 45 nanometer process the design rule would be different okay another example might be minimum spacing between let's say two metal wires is i'm just going to make this up 270 nanometer i'm not sure whether there is such a rule i'm just saying that it's an example a possibility okay the minimum contact ohmic contact which you want to create in order to actually connect with either the source or the drain Three sixty by three sixty, so it's a square, right? Minimum size is a square of size three sixty by three sixty nanometer. This is an example. All of these are just examples of design rules. Some of them are actually design rules. Some of them are just made up over here, right? But this is the nature of what they look like. Okay. So one possibility is that they are directly telling you numbers, telling you okay, one eighty nanometer, ninety nanometer, three sixty nanometer, and so on. what is typically done in practice or at least used to be done is that all of these are defined in terms of one single parameter called lambda and this lambda is related to the so called scalable schema okay what happens is people decided that you know every two years after all the transistor densities were doubling which means that transistor sizes were shrinking okay for it to for the number of transistors to double by how much should the transistor size decrease the length should go down by 1 over root 2 not half right because if it goes down by half you can pack four times the number of transistors so typically it will be by 1 over root 2 okay which is why you will find that 0.7 factor coming into all the technology parameters that you look at okay so originally there was something like 1 micron technology right at some point there was 2 micron then there was 1 micron technology then there was 0.7 micron then 0.5 then 0.35 micron 0.25 Point one eight, point one three, point nine, point six five, and point point zero nine, point zero six five, and so on. Right. So if you look at the scaling between each of those, it's roughly point seven or so, which is one over root two. Right. The idea is that intentionally that factor was chosen so that the number of transistors is more or less going to double. Right. Is there anything sacred about doubling it? No. It's just something for convenience. People understand it easily. Right. and it made a good target to go for now of course for the past several generations that exact factor of 0.7 has not been exactly valid the scaling has been whatever people are able to get 
right? But it doesn't matter, the basic concept still holds. The idea behind scalable CMOS was, you define one parameter, lambda, and you define all your design rules in terms of that parameter, lambda. Once you have done so, right, everything else that you need over there, then you want to shrink to the next process node from 0.35 micron down to 0.25 micron, right? All that you need to do is make that one change, change the lambda parameter to whatever is required from 0.35 to 0.25 and all your transistors, the NAND gates, the NOR gates, XOR gates, everything that you have designed will just scale and should still continue to work. Why? Because all the design rules will automatically be met because they were de defined in terms of lambda. Okay? So that was the original goal of the lambda design parameter. Nowadays, you will find that people don't bother with that lambda, it is too restrictive. If you stick to the lambda rules, you will end up with very pessimistic design. And you don't need to worry about the lambda rules because you are no longer designing these gates by hand. Right? There are tools that help you to do all of these things automatically and the tools can take care of any number of design rules that you want. They don't need to worry about doing things individually. Okay? So the design rules were such that everything was defined in terms of lambda. The typical thing is 2 lambda would be the minimum feature size. For example, it would be 180 nanometer, right? Which automatically, of course, implies that lambda is 90 nanometers over there for a 180 nanometer process. Okay? It's a bit curious. Why would you not define lambda straight away as 180, right? Why would you define 2 lambda as 180 so that lambda becomes 90? The reason is because the increment, the step size that is used for various other things, was lambda, was 90 nanometers, not 180 nanometers. So, for example, I can have, like I said, right, the minimum spacing between two metal wires is 3 lambda in the example that I have given above, right? If I defined lambda to be 180, then I would have had to say 3 by 2 lambda or something like that, inconvenient. So, I just defined 2 lambda as 180 nanometers and everything else in terms of that, okay? So, the magic layout tool that we will be using later makes use of this. The first thing you do is you essentially define your lambda parameter. Same thing, even the spice simulator. You can define everything in terms of the lambda parameter and then once you have defined your lambda, everything is just a multiple of lambda. You can specify your W's and L's, widths and lengths of transistors in terms of that lambda parameter. Okay? Makes it more convenient and easy to understand. That's all. Okay. So, all right. What do we have here until now? Essentially, we know what the side view of a transistor, side view and top view of a transistor look like. How the transistors are made such that they are automatically aligned properly and don't have any misalignment problem. And what are the design rules that are used in order to get the transistors working properly. Okay. Once again, like I said, a lot more detail on this and the processing steps involved will be covered in VLSI technology or might already have been covered in some other course that you have done earlier. Right? Now, let's get into how a transistor works and this is going to be really high level. I am not going to go into band diagrams or any other such detail. I am pretty much just going to give an intuitive understanding of the different modes of behavior of the transistor followed by an equation saying okay this is the current or at least this is the first order approximation of the current through the transistor. Okay? Details again, device modeling code. So the IV characteristics, right? The current versus voltage characteristics is what we are concerned with over here. So, what we have is a transistor that from the side looks like this.
right? The normal mode of behavior would be all the first step before we do anything else to it, first step would be to ground all the terminals, set all voltages to zero. Okay? Under those conditions, what do we have over here? Effectively, the bulk is three types, okay? And there are two N plus regions over there. What do you expect is going to happen as a result? Huh? What happens when there is a P and N plus junction? There will be depletion, right? So there will be some kind of a depletion area that forms over here. It will mostly be in the P type because N plus is not going to get strongly affected by the, I mean the depletion width is not going to be very much in the N plus region. Okay. We are concerned with the P region anyway, the substrate. Okay. Now, what are the different things that we can do with the voltages? Let's first consider VG alone, right, the gate voltage. And the first thing we do is we'll make it negative. What happens when the gate voltage is made negative, slightly negative? Intuitively at least, what we can know is, okay, the gate voltage has been made negative, but on the other hand, there is an insulating layer between the gate and the substrate. So, no current is going to flow, right? But because of that insulating layer, you can expect that some kind of positive charges effectively are going to get attracted to that interface, right? Because after all, if you apply a negative voltage, what does that do? It attracts positive charge. In the case of a semiconductor like this, what is a positive charge? The equivalent is a hole, right? So, there will be holes that get attracted to the interface between the insulator and the bulk substrate. Okay. In other words, we call this an accumulation of holes. Right. What happens is, already the three substrate majority carriers are holes. You apply a negative voltage, a few more holes accumulate over there. Not dramatically more, but a few more. When Vg is equal to zero, we already saw what happens. We have a depletion. Right? The interesting thing happens when Vg becomes greater than zero. Right? Effectively, what happens when you make Vg greater than zero is slowly negative charges get attracted towards that interface. This is just an intuitive, very high level understanding of the thing. What happens in practice is can only be understood in terms of band diagrams properly. Right? But intuitively, what is happening is some kind of negative charges are getting attracted towards that insulating layer. Okay? At some point, when Vg crosses some specific value, the number of those negative charges, carriers over there, shoots up exponentially. Okay? And that shooting up exponentially is critical. It means that very abruptly, for a very small change in V, the number of carriers changes very dramatically and becomes much larger than it was before. What kind of carriers? Negative carriers. Right? Which means that effectively the P-type substrate, what you are finding is a majority of negative carriers in one region of the P-type substrate alone, near that interface. Okay? So the P-type substrate is no longer behaving like a P-type substrate, it is behaving as though it was N-type because the majority carriers over there at least are electrons, ne negative. Okay? This process is called inversion.
and this happens only when you cross some specific voltage which we call the threshold voltage So at that insulator interface, the majority of carriers become negative, that is electron, which means it starts looking like an n-type semiconductor in that region. Okay. By nature, it is p-type. Therefore, we call it an inversion of the nature. Okay. So, what happens once the semiconductor is inverted? Effectively, what you have over there is two n plus region connected by an inverted region, right? The inverted region has a majority of n-type carriers. We call this a channel. Right? Why a channel? Because effectively what has happened is now two n plus regions connected by n, they can sort of communicate or current can flow between them through that n-type region. Okay? And it forms a channel that can be used to connect those two devices, those two segments together. Right? Once the channel has formed, right, if you further increase VGS, what happens? At that point, effectively, what is what the system looks like is that there is an insulator, there is a gate terminal, an insulator, and the bulk. Okay? This starts looking just like a capacitor. You increase VG still further, excess charge forms on the capacitor. How much is that excess charge? It will be given by some capacitance into the excess voltage. Okay? And how much is that capacitance itself? It is determined plainly by the nature of the material, the insulator. It just acts like a parallel plate capacitor. Right? There is an epsilon associated with it. Uh, oxide thickness associated with it, an area associated with the capacitance, based on all of that, you can calculate the capacitance and therefore find out the excess charge which is going to be there at that interface. Okay? And as a result of that charge accumulation, the current that can then, there is a, there is a possibility for a current to flow between the drain and the source devices, uh, terminal. Okay? Alright, so next thing, like I said, I am just going to pretty much write out the equation for that current. Okay, so the situation that we have is Vg is greater than Vt, channel has been formed. Now I increase Vd greater than 0. Okay, the source terminal is still grounded, it is a 0 potential, but the Vd has been increased slightly not by a large amount, but slightly. Okay? So, when Vd becomes greater than 0, what ends up happening over here is because of that charge which is there in the channel, there is a potential difference between drain and source. There are two n plus regions with charge lying between them. Potential gradient will cause that charge to flow. Okay? And that forms the current. 
right? So there are a number of derivations of what that current is. I am just going to write out the final expression for it straight away. It's going to be the drain current. Okay, we call it the drain current because it's flowing from drain to source. So I should probably call it the drain to source current, but we just call it drain current. Right? The drain current is going to be given by something a proportionality factor which we will call mu n right c of which is the gate oxide capacitance per unit area ok right now don't worry about how all of this came just think about intuitively what all of this means there is one proportionality constant mu n which we will talk about a bit later it is proportional to C of, which means the greater the C of, the greater the capacitance, greater the gate capacitance per unit area, the more the amount of current. Times W, where W is the width of the channel, divided by L, which is the length of the channel, right? into Vgf minus Vt, this is the gate overdrive, the excess voltage applied on the gate, right? The moment Vgf crosses Vt, we have inversion, Vgf minus Vt is some excess beyond that, okay? Minus Vgf by 2, where does this come from? Basically from the averaging process, it comes out of the equation, right? For now, just take it as a given. into VDS. Okay. So let's once again just go over this equation and interpret it. First thing, the current is proportional to the voltage. That's interesting. Effectively what it looks like is some kind of a resistance. Right? A current is proportional to a voltage means it looks like something like a resistance. Okay. In that resistance itself, there is a into W divided by L term. Okay. So, what does that mean? Effectively, the into W divided by L, if I draw a sort of 3D view of the transistor, This here is the width W and this is the length of the channel. Okay? In a situation like this, what we are saying is the current is proportional to the width. The wider the transistor, the larger the amount of current. Okay? Once again, that's also similar to what you would expect in a wire. Right? Wider wire means greater area of cross section, therefore more current. Longer the channel or the longer the wire, lesser the current or greater the resistance. Okay? So, in other words, in this region entirely this thing is beginning to look just like a resistance. Okay? For small enough values of VDS. Right? So, this mode of behavior is usually called the resistive region or the linear region or sometimes also called the triode region. Right? What happens as you increase VDS still further? At some point as I increase VDS, I will get to a stage where the drain to gate voltage, right? That effectively becomes zero. When does that happen? When VDS is equal to VGS, VGS minus VT. Okay, that is not the drain to gate voltage, but the voltage at this junction on the surface. 
Okay? BT has already dropped across the channel. So whatever BG that I applied, BT out of that has dropped across the channel. Now the drain to channel voltage over there will become zero when VD becomes equal to VDS becomes equal to VGS minus VT. Okay? So something special is going to happen to this equation when VDS becomes equal to VGS minus VT. Okay? What we say is that a phenomenon called pinch off occurs. Right? Which prevents any further increase in the amount of accumulated charge and also prevents any further increase in the current. Okay? So at that point when pinch off occurs the current I D becomes same mu and c of w by l, same equation as before, but just plug in Vds equal to Vgs minus Vt. After all, the system is continuous, right? We want it to be a, the same equation to hold at that point. Right? Now, what has happened over here is, this particular equation holds when Vds is equal to Vgs minus Vt. What we are saying is, it will remain the same for Vds greater than Vgs minus Vt. Okay? So from here onwards, even if I increase Vds, that is the drain current, drain voltage, there is going to be no increase in current because this equation is independent of Vds. It depends only on Vgs minus Vt. Okay? So, if we have this situation, what we are effectively saying is, up to some point the current increased and then it saturated or stopped increasing. Right? So, for obvious reasons, this region is called the region of saturation. Right? The current is no longer going to increase. Okay? Now, for all practical purposes, we are already done with what we need to know as far as how our transistor behaves. Initially, for small values of VGS, less than the threshold voltage, there is no channel, there can be no current through the transistor, no ID, ID is equal to zero. Once the voltage across the gate to source, VGS, exceeds VT, channel is formed, from there onwards, the current is determined by the drain to source voltage, right, as given by this equation. But once the drain to source voltage becomes sufficiently large, the system saturates and it becomes constant, okay. So to a first order at least, we have already described what the behavior of a transistor is like. Everything that we need to know about the transistor is already defined over here. Okay? And this is in fact sufficient for quite a lot of the calculations involving transistors, including understanding how a CMOS inverter works and so on. Okay? Let's try to get a, you know, of course, now that's not all there is to it. Especially in modern day transistors, there are a number of effects that come in later. Right? which we will also look at. But first, before we do anything further, let's just look graphically. Right? If we can get a feel for what are the kinds of diagrams, the ID versus VGS, VDS and so on that you would like to look at, which helps you understand how the transistor behaves. Okay? So, let's say that I decide to plot ID, the drain current of the transistor, as a function of VDS, the drain to source voltage, right? Now there is one more, one more varying parameter over here which is VGS. Right? Vt, mu and c of WL, all of those are constants as far as a given transistor is concerned. 
right? So what does this diagram look like? The ID versus BGS. Again, probably you must all be familiar with this diagram, but it bears repetition. Initially, for low values of BGS, flat. Okay. For some other value of VGS greater than VT, what do we have? This grows as the equation It is an inverted parabola, right? This equation that we have over here Okay. This is what it looks like. So the dash part of it is not really part of the regular operation. It is just an extension of that function diagram. Right. Up to the point where VDS becomes equal to VGS minus VT. At this point it stops growing and becomes constant. Okay. So, this is probably for let us say VGS minus VT equal to maybe 0.1 volts or 0.2 volts. Right. Similarly, there will be another curve which goes up to somewhere here, then becomes constant. VGS minus VT equal to 0.4 volts. Vgs minus Vt equal to 0.6 volts and so on. Okay, you take all of these points where it first goes into saturation, right? Connect them up, and you again end up with a parabola, right? What is that? That is this expression, right? So, a few things to observe over here, one of them is when Vgs minus Vt is less than 0, that is Vgs is less than Vt, the current Id is equal to 0. Once Vgs becomes greater than Vt, it goes up to a certain point and saturates. For given increment in VGS minus VT, VGS minus VT increasing by 0.2 volts or 0.1 volts, the increase in the current is quadratic, right? It goes as VGS minus VT the whole square. That is the increase in the saturation current. Okay. As far as regions of operation are concerned, this is the linear or resistive region. This is saturation and this is cut off. Okay. Now, as far as we are concerned, the kind of transistors that we are going to be dealing with, even at 180 nanometers, 180 nanometers is now a relatively old technology. Right? It is still there, it is still used in practice quite a lot, but compared to what exists at the moment, it is a relatively old technology. Okay? The advantage of old is it is also very mature and things do not change so much, right? which is why we are using it as the foundation for this course, even now. Okay? Where necessary or if important, we will be pointing out the differences in newer technology, but for the most part you can consider 180 nanometers as a representative technology that captures many of the effects that exist even now. Okay. So, in, even in 180 nanometer technology, one of the things that happens over here is, so we have seen all of this, what happens when the channel forms, a bunch of electrons accumulate in that channel, 
then you apply a VDS that VDS causes a potential gradient electron start flowing current flow ok now that term that we had over there mu n is related to something called the mobility the surface mobility of electron at that interface ok so in that inverted region what is the mobility that the electrons have ok and how is mobility related to anything that we are interested in effectively the speed of the electrons the speed with which they move is going to be given by mu n times the electric field ok which is in other words mu n times dv by dx as an approximation mu n times v d s by l ok I am taking this as a first order approximation of the electric field that is present in the channel after all what is the entire potential drop across the channel v d s drain to source what is the length across which it falls L. So, VDS by L is an approximate measure of the total fields that we have. Okay. So, mu n into VDS by L is going to be a measure of the current, no sorry not the current, the speed of the electrons of the individual electron. Okay. Now, VDS can go for a 180 nanometer technology up to around 1.8 volt right mu n is again a technology parameter it is approximately around 180 centimeter square per volt second for 180 nanometer process for some 180 nanometer process these numbers are not accurate or exact they are representative ok L is 180 nanometer. Okay, the minimum feature size that you can get away with. Okay, if I plug all of these in, what am I going to get? The number that I end up with is somewhere greater than 10 power 5 meters per second. Now it turns out it is around approximately 2 into 10 power 5 meters per second is what the peak speed that you can estimate for the electron. Right? Now it turns out that in practice due to the physical nature of the medium through which we are trying to move, once the electrons cross a certain speed like this, there is no way that they can be further accelerated. Okay. So, we end up with a saturation in the velocity of the electron and the current itself stops increasing beyond that point. Okay. We will stop here for now. Uh, like I said, tomorrow there will be no class. On Friday, we will continue, finish up the remaining parts of this and then move on to the capacitance associated with the transfer.